All right. Hello, Kalish. Um, I, let's see, I'm not sure if we got anybody on. It doesn't look like we've got any viewers yet, but um, anyway, um, there we, we've got a viewer on. Okay, excellent. Okay, so I am Brent Olson. Um, I'm the campaign director for the Libertarian Pragmatist Caucus. I'm former vice chair of the Libertarian Party of California. And also, I was the uh, campaign manager for the Kalish Morrill for Hanford City Council 2020 campaign. Um, and Kalish, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, Kalish Morrill, uh, the product of all of Brent's hard work to get me elected to Hanford City Council that took place this past year. All right. So <laughs> let's see. Um, All right. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk briefly about campaign management and strategy, kind of how to win a local election. Um, we're going to talk about the strategy that Kalish and I use. This is a strategy that we developed together. Um, it was my, well, it was my second campaign, but the first campaign was my own. Um, and I've worked on other campaigns, but this is the only the second campaign I've managed. And my first campaign that I managed was back which was my own was back in 96. So vastly different um, kind of thing. And I do not recommend the candidates run their own campaign. It's a terrible idea. And Kalish can vouch for that with, from her own personal experience from 2016. Yep. <laughs> that one did not turn out well either. <laughs> so um, let's see. I'm just, I'm new to this setup. So I'm just, uh, okay. All right. So I'm just looking at, um, some of the settings here and what we'll do is we'll go ahead and get started um i'm gonna put up a uh little slideshow and let's see all right and do we see the slideshow on there? Yes, but it it's not in slideshow format yet. Okay, here we go. There we, there go. we go. Just wanted to make sure we got it on there. Okay, so mm -hmm. we call this the Olson Morrow method. So a lot of this um, uses techniques and, and things that I've learned from uh, some of the greatest in the Libertarian Party, Boomer Shannon, um, Kara Schultz, and Apollo Pizzell. Um, but Kalish and I kind of kind of created our own way of doing things, and this campaign was run very different from differently from other campaigns that I've seen in the past. So it was a it was a very busy campaign and entertaining, but and interesting. But you know, it took a lot of work. So uh, anyway, let's uh, go on and we'll take questions after we, we run through these because I literally cannot see um, the comments on the screen while I've got it in this sharing mode. So we'll just go ahead and start here. So um, first thing is, so why do you want to run for office? Um, you know, to, in order to decide what it is you want to run for, and what it is you, how you want to run your campaign. We need to understand why you're running for office. What are you hoping to accomplish? If you're planning on winning, then you really have to take into consideration the office that you're running for and how, how realistic it is for you as a candidate to win that election. If you're just hoping to kind of get the word out there, kind of get people familiar with the Libertarian Party or Libertarian concepts, then that's an entirely different thing. Um, and so, so that would require a different kind of campaign. What we're doing here today is we're talking about how to w run a winning campaign. And so there are certain things that you need to, to do before you, you run for office. Um, so Kalish, for example, ran for Hanford City Council. Um, so I think it's very important that you understand what the role is of the whatever job it is that you're applying for. Um, you know, so if you're running for city council, you need to understand what it is that city council does, um, what they have power over. Um, 
and you know have have an understanding of where their power is limited because you don't want to go out and promise things you can't deliver on. Kalish, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I would say that just simply showing up to the meetings themselves, whether it's city council or commissions, you know, there's different boards to, to, to run for a school board, any of those things, start going to those meetings. Uh, you can start getting in the backstory of what's going on. It's great networking to talk to the people who are on those boards, get to know them. And you really get to know what the issues are behind the scenes, why they are the way that they are. Uh, really being able to get a real in-depth understanding of what the issues are in your own community. And then you can speak intelligently about that, formulate your plans, um, and start connecting with the, the people in your community. And I think that was a big, big help, uh, you know, for me. I, I knew the history of things that were going on. And so when I was out there door knocking, people would bring up different uh, different concerns. And I would be like, oh, yes, I, I know about that. And moving forward, I know the city is wanting to look at X, Y, Z, or, oh, hey, that's an interesting thing. Um, I can reach out to so-and-so and, -so and um, you know, that, I, that can become part of the plan of moving forward, you know, once I get into office or these are the issues, why I didn't get done, you know, those kinds of things. So yeah, definitely showing up to the meetings is, would be a huge benefit to you. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's something that both Kalisha and I were doing. We were showing up to the Hanford city council meetings for, a couple of years before we she she ran again. Well, actually, more than a couple of years because we had been going to meetings together for about four years. So after yeah. after she had lost her last campaign, so we became very familiar and intimate with the uh, city council and the members of the city council. Um, we got to know them in advance, which was helpful. I think it's very important for you to be able to do that before you run for that office, whether it's city council or or whatever it is you're planning on running for. Um, and let's see. And again, I want to say this is for local campaigns. I know they say all politics is local, but this campaign plan would not work for a, let's say a run for governor or something at statewide off level. Um, this is really more at a local level. Um, let's see the, the second part of preparing for that run for office is to develop a resume. There are a lot of ways you can do this. Um, you can get on, you know, planning commission or some kind of a commission that's that's in your local area um, you can you can get involved alternatively because you have to get appointed to those commissions which is not always easy it kind of depends on where you're at and who you are um, but another way of, of developing that resume is getting involved in local organizations um, and getting your your name out there and that's something that Kalish had done do you want to talk a little bit about that Kalish? Right. So, I mean, I had already, I had a business in town, so that helped out a bit, but then I had been on the Main Street board and the, I had formed my own nonprofit that was meant to help restore downtown. Uh, but aside from doing those kinds of things, a lot of community outreach, um, you know, and I, and again, going into being in the know of what's going on with your community. So, you know, I, I was reached out to when they were trying to tear down a historic building and got together a protest for that. We did a candlelight vigil for that. We did these heart bombs, which are car, um, construction paper cut cutouts. And we put messages from all around the community. And then of course there were park cleanups. There's a, there's a lot of different things that you can do uh, that even if you aren't getting on a commission, because again, I never made it onto a commission, but I was able to build up a lot of name recognition and a lot of clout too with the, the community. They want to see that you're out there working for them. And that, that was a huge boom to my campaign. And, you know, cause I think that libertarians definitely, we want to run for the right reasons. We want to make a change. We don't want to just go for the title. Yes, we want to grow the party and, and build our grassroots movement. But but really, the whole reason why most of us get into government is because we don't like government. <laughs> so, uh, But going out there and showing that you are really you truly care about the, the community will do wonders for you. Um, you know, putting out press releases, too, especially if you're uh, if you are part of your local central committee you know we've, we've got libertarian party of kings county we put out press releases those kinds of things too to get your name out there a lot more yeah we were actually um 
we, we were in a very positive situation going into this campaign because the local newspaper, um, Hanford Sentinel, had actually asked the Libertarian Party of Kings County to start doing a weekly column, which w was very helpful because that was, we were able to get Kalisha's name out there a little bit more, um, having that side benefit. Um, not, not everybody's going to be so lucky, but we were very fortunate to be able to do that. Now, as far as developing a resume, that's something that we're actually going to have Shane Strawn, who is on the Hanford Parks and Recreation Commission. He's a fellow libertarian. He helped with Kalisha's campaign. He's going to get on and do a training in the future, possibly next month. I'm going to have to work that out with him as far as the schedule and talk about how you can build your resume, um, what it takes to get onto a commission, other things that you can do. Um, so we'll we'll talk a bit about about that a little bit more in the future. Um, all right. So the once you've figured out why you're running, what you're running for, you've got the, your resume set up. Um, next next step is getting a campaign manager. As I had said before, this is incredibly important. Um, you and you've got to find somebody who who is going to be a good fit. Um, you know, you've got to have somebody who has been trained or has some knowledge about it. Um, somebody just having a campaign manager who doesn't have any clue what they're doing or doesn't do anything, which I've seen a lot of people, to be honest, in my, in 96, I had a campaign manager that was basically just a paper manager. I managed my own campaign. That's not a good idea. Um, you need to actually find an, an actual campaign manager that's going to manage your campaign. So let's talk about what the campaign manager does. Um, so the the role of the campaign manager is really um, if we if we look at leadership intelligence, there's four different types of leadership intelligence according to Kiersey. And I'm a licensed psychologist, so that's kind of an area of the, that I know a little bit about. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But those those four areas are strategic, logistic, tactical, and diplomatic. And so the roles of the campaign manager really fall more in the strategic and the uh, logistic side of things, and whereas the candidate is more tactical and diplomatic. Um, and so to, to talk about that more in terms of what the job is, so the, the campaign manager sets up the campaign plan. They, they develop the strategy. How are we going to win this campaign? How are we going to what are we going to do? What do we need to do? How much money do we need to raise? All of those things are things that the campaign manager figures out. Those are not things that the candidate should have to worry about. Um, that That's all on the campaign manager. How many volunteers do we need? How are we going to get those volunteers? All of that should be on the campaign manager's shoulders. So what's the candidate's job, Kalish? The candidate's job is to go out there and be the candidate, and not have to worry about all these other things that are going on behind the scenes. And that was such a such a game changer for me in this campaign. You know, again, I ran back in 2016 and just trying to worry about everything, logos and getting, you know, filing paperwork, all those sorts of things. So it was great that I didn't have to worry about that stuff. You know, and then we and the the campaign manager had our volunteers organized. So on nights that I couldn't get out and door knock that he already had it all figured out. He had people out there knocking, whether it was one person or five, it didn't matter. I knew that it was covered on the days that I couldn't go out there myself because I had different things. Um, we had interviews going on. I was uh, trying to get endorsements from different organizations. And a lot of those times would happen. Uh, th those would be scheduled at times that we would be out door knocking. So I, I was able to take the time and prepare for the questions that I was going to get and research and do all those things rather than being bogged down with, with, you know, making sure that we've got the mailers out on time, those kinds of things. So, you know, it really allows you to be the best candidate that you can be by having somebody who's just in the background running all the things for you. So you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. And, and another very important job of the candidate is also to reach out to those um, big donors. So the, the smaller donors, the campaign manager usually deals with that more so trying to get those smaller donations. 
And then the campaign manager will reach out, do the initial reach out to the big donors. Um, but then it's really going to come down to the candidate making that connection and making their pitch and getting getting that sell, getting that money from those bigger donors um, and making that relationship. Um, as far as who's the boss, that that's an interesting uh, interesting thing to look at because kind of both. So if you think about it, the candidate is the hiring authority. They decide whether or not the campaign manager is doing an adequate job, whether they want to keep the campaign manager on. But the campaign manager is going to tell the candidate what to do a lot of the time, like what neighborhoods to go knock door on doors, um, what they need to bring up when they're when they're out talking and messaging, like things that they know they've they've gotten back from volunteers that have been going out and door knocking and getting from the public. They'll they'll bring up some of those issues, um, and so you know it's it's important that the uh, campaign manager can trust the the uh, or the candidate can trust the campaign manager. And it's, it's important that they work very closely together. Um, so ultimately, the candidate's the boss, but the campaign manager is going to boss the, the candidate around quite a bit. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. So one of, the, one of the first steps in developing the campaign, campaign plan is to do some research and analysis. Um, some of the things that we're going to look at is Previous election results, you're going to look at um, the election from whatever district your office you're running for from the most recent election. So in Kalisha's case, it was four years prior and she had been a candidate in that. So we look at those results. Um, we analyze the those results. Um, it's also helpful to look at other elections that are similar. So for example, um, I looked at the 2018 city council races um, that also took place in Hanford. Um, but you want to you want to know, you want to get a sense of who the candidates were, what they did, what they did right, what they did wrong, um, how much money they spent. Um, that's very important to find out how much money has been spent in previous campaigns. Um, because you want to know approximately what you're going to need um, before you getting get into the hard, like as you develop your plan, you get a better sense of how much money you're going to need for what you want to do. But this just kind of gives you a basic idea of like, okay, this is how much has been spent in the past. Um, and then you're going to want voter registration data. And what you're going to want to look at with the voter registration data is and do a breakdown and analysis. How many Republicans, how many Democrats, and this is just the district that you're running in. Not, you, know, you don't need to worry about anything but the district that your candidate's running in. Um, how many no party preference? Um, you're going to want to get some of those ideas. How many, how many um, active voters or voters who um, are high propensity voters there are in the district? Um, you're going to want to look at those kinds of things. You're also going to want to look at voter trends. Um, so I looked at several elections in a row for the same office. So the, the Hanford City Council District B, I looked at several different elections um, to see what the voter trends were as far as voter turnout and, and percentage increase in registered voters. Um, to kind of get an idea because we started the campaign and developed the campaign plan earlier than than uh, we were actually out campaigning. And so we wanted to, even though we had a sense of where the voter registration base was at at that time, we wanted to kind of have a sense of where it might get to as we approached election day. So you want to know voter trends and what the per what the turnout is in those elections. These are all things, I know I'm covering these things fairly quickly, but this is just kind of a 101. Um, so this is your, your first class in a sense, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this stuff in more detail in future trainings. Um, some other things you wanna know about, you wanna know about your opponents. Um, a lot of times you know going in, especially if you're facing an incumbent who your opponents likely are going to be. Um, and you need to know as much as you can about 
those people. Um, fortunately for Kalisha's campaign, um, we knew the incumbent was likely going to run, and she did. And we knew a lot about her. We knew that she was very popular, and she could win without doing anything, literally. Because um, she had in, in 2016. She put out a few signs, spent, I don't know if she spent any money. because She used yeah. recycled signs. Um, her signs had started out red, and by the time that election came along, they were pink. So... There was basically recycled signs that had turned pink from the being out in the sun. Um, so I don't know that she spent any money and she didn't go out and knock doors at all. So, um, yeah, she didn't even put out a candidate statement either. Yeah. And in this um, case, too, she was the only one, uh, you know, it was a four way race back in 2016. And I spent a little bit of money. Again, I was super green. So I'm not even really going to count my race that much. But there was the, the runner up spent about $8,000 and was outdoor knocking and still the, uh, the in who ended up being the incumbent um, that I ran against. Uh, she, again, didn't have to do anything. So we knew that we had a lot of name recognition. And this kind of goes to, uh, it brings me to my point where every campaign's different and you have to gauge the uh, things differently and be, you know, go, go to that strategy too. So, um, but yeah, yeah, knowing your, your opponents for sure. Absolutely. Um, and mm -hmm. one of the benefits of running against an incumbent is a lot of the time they don't go out and no knock on doors. They, they kind of take it for granted that they're just going to win, especially if they've won multiple times, like, like uh, Kalisha's opponent had um and then her other opponent was a young man 21 years old um we knew that he worked in the movie theater at the time when we first started the campaign going um later on because of covid the movie theater shut down and he got a job at i think a bar locally um because of course they kept the bars open but closed the movie theaters so um so uh, yeah, so we knew that, and he was also on the planning commission. So he kind of had that going for him. And he was very involved in trying to get the endorsements of like the, the firemen, like he was hanging out with the fire department all the time and the police. So he was really working on getting those endorsements, which he did not get. Um, so they, they actually didn't endorse anybody that, so, um, so that didn't work out to his benefit, but we knew that he was very young and we knew that we could use that to our advantage um, going forward in the campaign. Um, let's see. So what, what goes into the campaign plan? Um, kind of a campaign overview. It would include things like announcement and filing. So you're gonna want to know like when you're gonna announce that you're running and make sure you file the right paperwork because like in the state of California, you have to file an intent to, to run as a candidate. Um, and so, and that's probably something you have to do in a lot of jurisdictions. I mean, you don't have to do that to announce, but you have to do that before you start fundraising and you want to start, especially as a libertarian, you really want to start fundraising as early as possible. Um, so you want to get the ball rolling on that. Um, but some jurisdictions have filing dates attached. Here in Hanford, you can literally start your campaign at any time you want. Kalish has already filed to run again in uh, in 2024. So um, let's see. In the campaign overview, you're going to describe your opponents um, and describe their, you know, their history, their what you perceive as their weaknesses, their strengths. Um, you're also going to want to calculate your win number. So in Kalisha's race, it was a, a three-way race. So we knew that we needed to get at least one third of the vote plus one. Uh, we wanted to go a little bit above that. So I think we were aiming for 36%, which we outdid. Um, we, we ended up getting 42% of the vote. Um, but we were aiming for about 36% as our win number. Um, and you actually need to know not just the percentage, but the number of votes that that is comes out to be. Um, you want to figure out your expected costs um, around how much you plan to spend and therefore raise in order to win the race. And you kind of describe that in the campaign overview. 
Um, next, after the campaign overview, you described the voter registration data. Um, and these are things, again, we'll do future trainings on, but the voter registration data, you kind of want to use that to formulate a plan. So for Kalish, um, we knew that the Democrats and, um, and the uh, third party voters tended to be lower turnout voters lower propensity, whereas the Republicans were very high propensity and no party preference had a good propensity. So we kind of wanted to focus our attention on getting those um, third party voters, those no party preference voters to vote for Kalish. We figured the Republicans would probably vote for the incumbent, uh, um, but we wanted to try to get at least a percentage of them. I don't remember the exact percentage. and. Um, and then we wanted to be able to get those Democrat voters. We knew that they would probably go for Kalisha's other opponent, the young man, because he was a former Democrat. But that actually, the fact that he had switched parties from Democrat to no party preference worked in our favor. Um, as we went into the campaign, we discovered that a lot of the people very involved in the local Democratic Party were upset for, with him for switching parties just to, to try to get a win because our district is more heavily Republican. And so he was trying to switch in order to just get the win. Um, and that worked to his disadvantage. So we got a lot of those Democrats, but you kind of want to have numbers in mind of how many of these people you want to draw and where you want to put your focus. Um, so initially we were going to focus on the high propensity voters from the Democrat Democrats and Republicans, and then all of the third party voters and no party preference voters um, was what our initial plan was. Um, we wanted to try to get some of those third party and no party preference voters to the polls who might not have voted in previous elections because maybe they, they didn't feel like they were represented well. Um, and then you're gonna do an overview of the last election, so like, for 2020, we did an overview of the 2016 election. You want to do a standard turnout model. So that includes like what, what the turnout's been in the past, approximately how many people you expect to turn out this for this election cycle based on the, the previous election years. Um, and then you develop a winning scenario. A winning scenario would be you're going to get this many Democrats, this many Republicans, this many no party preference, and just basically how how many people you're going to get to get to the win number that you have. Um, so you create a winning scenario so that you can kind of go forward with that in mind. Um, and then I'm going to talk more about the candidates. So we're going to, um, in the campaign plan, give very detailed descriptions of our candidate, what their strengths and weaknesses are, and then the other candidates. Um, and then in the campaign plan, you need to make sure you have all the important dates. You need to know when you have to file, when you have to file your like FPPC in California, other states would have, and local jurisdictions would have other kind of filing, but those are like our financial filings, that kind of stuff. Um, you need to know when the mail-out ballots go out because you have to basically, your campaign is not over when mail-out ballots go out, but you have to have done the bulk of your work before the mail-out ballots go out because most people, at least in California, and I imagine in a lot of other states where they do the mail-out ballots, um, that people vote by mail. So you're going to want to get basically be at the tail end of your campaign by the time they send out those ballots. And that was, I know that was a mistake that Kalish had made in 2016. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I didn't really start my campaign until right when those came out. I had no idea. And I, I figured, because I was the one that always showed up at the polls, I didn't, and again, that's good to know your data. I didn't know any of the data. And I started out, you know, campaigning just in October, right before, <laughs> right when everything came out. And then that was another thing too. We, we went into panic mode. We have everything all, uh, all lined out for the dates when we wanted to get things done in, in this past year. And um, I got, 
I, I don't know what it brought my attention to when the, the mail-in ballots were going to go out and they were going out a whole week earlier than we had anticipated. So we had to ramp it up a bit more too. So we would make it, like you said, we wanted to be, have mo a bulk of our campaign done by the time it, um, by the time those were hitting the mailboxes and we needed to bump up when our second mailer was going out too. So those were, those were some key dates for sure. Yeah, the, it's very important. That these are things that, again, we'll do future trainings on because this is just our initial training. But some of those dates, like when the those um, first ballots go out, we wanted to do our first mailing about a week before, like get it actually in the mailboxes about a week before the, the ballots arrived. Our second mailing, we wanted to hit right when the ballots arrived. And then we did a third mailing as well, which we had just a few days behind that um maybe a week behind that so you know it that way we we were hitting people before they got their ballots we were hitting people right when they got their ballots and that second mailer was really key because what we included on that mailer was a comparison of the different candidates and at that point it was too late for our opponents to respond they had no idea what was hitting them and this was very key and as, as we were knocking on doors at that point people were bringing up the fact that they had received this and they they were very appreciative because it gave them information about all the the various candidates in the election um but our opponents weren't able to respond with, with their own mailers about what they found on this and then our third mailer we mailed it was about i guess it was about a week after the that um second one went out and so so they were getting mail about our candidate um throughout the process um which is very important so outreach strategy so how do we get ourselves out there to for the voters to see one of the things we really have to remember very important for us to remember is that most voters especially when it comes to local campaigns are low information voters what that means is they don't pay attention to local politics they might pay attention to what's happening at the federal level um that that's what most of them pay attention to next step is you know so a few less pay attention to what's happening at the state level but a lot less pay attention to what's happening at the local level. And they have no idea what's happening at the city council level or who, like most people don't even know who their city council person is. Um, or even the mayor. <laughs> yeah. And so this is something that you have to remember going out and campaigning that most people are low information voters. So what that means is it's very important for them to see your name as a candidate over and over and over again, because they're gonna vote for the person that they see the most. Um, so our outreach strategy, our most important outreach strategy is gonna be door-to-door -door canvassing. Um, you've gotta hit all those doors that you plan to hit. Like what initially in our plan, and this is what this, you know, the difference between strategy and tactics. Um, Initially, our plan was to um, hit only the high propensity voters the, of the Democrats and Republicans, and then everybody else, we were going to get hit all the doors. We found that we had plenty of time to hit every single door, so we did. Um, so that's kind of thinking on the spot and changing your strategy as, as you go based on the information that's coming in. Um, not everybody depending on the size of your district is going to be able to hit every single door or the number of people that you have working for your campaign it's great if you can because a lot of those people that you knock on the doors of who haven't had their doors knocked before are going to be living in like like lower in socioeconomic status lower income areas and they don't have a lot of um they don't have a lot of candidates or campaigns knocking at their doors and so they they don't really feel connected to the process. And so if you knock on their door, even though they're lower propensity, they may end up voting for you just because, wow, this person came to the door. Um, and this is what we found in Kalisha's race because we did have time to hit every door. We had a lot of people who were like, wow, I'm gonna vote for you because 
you actually care. You you show up in this neighborhood, not the best neighborhood, but you show up and you ask us what we're in, what we're concerned about. Um, and what I'd like to add to that too is I having um, my background with business to um, brand brand recognition is really really big. So. Aside from already having the logo on the mailers and we have our signs around town and some of the billboards too, uh, the entire team had uh, the campaign shirts on while we were out door knocking. And, you know, Brent can, can attest to this where he was going up to doors and they, their doors were opening up being like, oh, my God, I've been wanting to talk to uh, either Kalisha or somebody from her, her campaign. I'm so glad that you're here. But they were recognizing us on the spot because yeah. of the brand. Yeah, absolutely. They had heard from their neighbors or they had seen the signs and it had caught their eye. Um, yeah, it was it was a lot. It was very exciting. Um, and so obviously door to door canvassing is something that the uh, candidates going to be involved in. But it's but they can't do it alone, or at least in most districts, they can't do it alone. Um, and so you're going to need some volunteers or paid staff to help with that. Um, phone banking, that's something that um, in this particular campaign, we used it, but it, it, what we found is that a lot of the phone numbers that we had available to us were not actually any good anymore. And people, even when they were good, people didn't pick up the phone a lot. Um, so we didn't, so we didn't find it super helpful. That's not to say it's not helpful, but it's something, you know, certainly if you've only got a limited number of volunteers, door-to-door -door canvassing's where it's at. If if you've got volunteers that aren't able to door-to-door -to -door canvas, because maybe they live, you know, we're libertarians, so we have people from all over the country helping us. Maybe they live in another state or somewhere else in the state that's far from, you know, they're, they're just not able to come out and help. So if they can phone bank, then great. Um, but don't count on getting votes by phone banking alone. Um, direct mail was essential. We sent out three mailers. Our first piece was targeted. So we sent out one mailer to, to conservatives, um, one mailer to liberals, and then one mailer to people who were like no party preference. Um, and then um, Kalisha also hand wrote notes to all the libertarians in her district, um, which I think was a great personal touch. Um, and I and I'd recommend uh, yeah, for next time because you know, we're, I think I had about 60 letters to write out. It didn't seem like that big of a deal at the time, but it got pretty arduous <laughs> after a little bit. Um, so next time I decide to do that, I'm going to come up with like kind of your, you know, some words already out there, some, a phrase or something, a sentence paragraph, and then personalize it with a couple more sentences. Cause I was looking around at the neighborhoods. Okay. I knew that there's certain issues going on in each neighborhood. So I would maybe speak to whatever they've got going on there uh, just to give it that personal touch. But you know, the, the advantage of there being so few of us is that we can do that, that, make it a little bit more personal and hopefully grow the party that way too, grow their involvement. So that was, that was that strategy. Yeah. Um, so, so, and our, so our first mailer was kind of um, targeted. Our second mailer was a comparison between all the candidates. And with these mailers, we didn't want to use, we're libertarians. So it's easy to get into using extremist language, but you don't want to do that because you're trying to win votes. You're not trying to, scare people away or make people, you know, just get people riled up that, who are more extreme. You want to get, you want to hit those average everyday voters who, you know, aren't, aren't attuned to all of these issues and aren't as extreme in their thoughts. So you want to win the campaign. And so, you know, with these mailers, you, you'd really want to be careful how you, how you lay it out. Um, and I would suggest too, you know, the uh, with the Republicans, you can be a little bit more straightforward. You know, fiscal responsibility, those kinds of things. Um, with the liberal crowd, though, you want to go with something that speaks to the heart. That's yeah, what really you, resonates with them. Something so, that hits their feels. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, robocalls we didn't use in this campaign. It's something that you can use. I, I don't recommend it really, unless you're doing a 
campaign where you have a lot of voter, voters in your district. So something like maybe county supervisor, um, mm -hmm. something something at that level where you've just got a lot of people you got to hit. Um, I think then in that case, then robocalls might be cost effective, a, a cost effective way to get your name out there to people. But again, a lot of the phone numbers we had in our data were ended up not being good. Um, emails, that was another thing that we used. Um, it, I, I do think the emails helped somewhat because um, we did get some positive responses back, people asking for signs, saying that um, Kalish had their vote. Um, so that there was some, you know, I think there was some advantage to doing the emails. Again, you don't get emails for all the voters, though. So so you don't want to rely on those things alone. The door-to-door -door canvassing is really the most essential thing that you can do in your outreach. Um, so get out the vote strategy um, is the next area of the campaign plan. Um, so vote by mail, you really want to have a strategy to get those people to vote for you. That was that was part of what the uh, third mailer was, is a reminder for people to vote. Um, and then also we sent out some uh, email. I think we sent out maybe two emails after the e the ballots had gone out, just reminding people to vote for Kalish Morrow. Um, and then on election day, we also, um, we also send out an email blast to to folks um, tr reminding them to vote for Kalish. Um, so you want to have that strategy down. You want to you want to know the dates that you want to get these things out and what you want to do. Um, if you've got enough people, it's great to offer like rides to the polls for election day, that kind of thing. Um, I. As I recall, we had offered that in our emails, but nobody took us up on it, which is, you know, that that's per, that's fine. That works. Um, let's see. Oh, one thing I did want to mention, we got Kalish a phone special for her campaign and told people, you know, it was on, on all our, like on our door hanging brochures, on all our mailers, it had that number on it. And, and it indicated it was directly to her. And um, this was something that Kara Schultz had suggested. And she said, you likely won't get any calls. Well, Kalish did get calls, um, but it turned out positive. Calls. So. I, it, and it was really uh, surprising too, because we have a, I have a really good friend of mine and his business is a political consulting company. So when, he he was throwing out the idea. We were already on it though, and uh, and he said, "But don't worry, you're really not going to get many calls. You you don't have to field love questions or anything." And I said, "Really, my my phone's been blowing up." And he he was just he sat there in silence for a minute, and he said that that never happens. So I don't I don't know <laughs> what what if there was something specific that spurred it, or if this was just um, we just made a really big splash with the campaign. I, I think it may have been a. a you know, multifaceted reason why we, we got so many calls, but uh, yeah, it was, it was good to have a, a separate phone though, at least for me, I'm not good with phone calls. So it was nice to just be able to compartmentalize those, uh, those issues on one, on one go. Yeah. All right. Campaign signs. So this is something that I know is very controversial and I've heard a lot of people say that they're not important but I, I'm going to argue that they are. Um, so again, most of your voters are low information voters. If you're voting, especially if you're running in a nonpartisan election, then all these people have to go on is your name. The more they see your name, the better. If they see your name in their neighbor's yard, that's great. Um, so signs are really important. So it's important to know how many signs to get. Um, so basically, the um, the breakdown of figuring out how many signs you need to get is what I have up on the screen. So, um, so you need to first know your the number of registered voters you have. So, say you've got five thousand registered voters um, in your district. So then you take the percentage of voter turnout that you expect. So, say it's forty percent in Kalisha's district. It was far higher. I I think it was in the high 60s or low 70% range of voter turnout. 
but this is just the the numbers that I'm using for this. So say you have 40% voter turnout. So out of those 5,000, you expect 2,000 to vote. Then you look at what what your vote goal is. So say you want to get 52% of the those voters. That's your that's your target. That's your win number. So out of those 2,000, your win number is 1,040. Um, so then you divide that number by six, and that gives you the number of signs you need. So 173 is a weird number. So you're probably going to go on want to go with like 200 signs or something like that um, in that in this particular example. So, but th this is the ratio of the number of signs you're want to going to want to get. And you know, it's important to put some of your bigger signs up in some high traffic areas. Um, but really, it's even more important to get signs in every single neighborhood. Um, so when you're knocking on doors, when your volunteers are knocking on doors, every single door, ask if you can put a sign up, even if they don't know if they're going to vote for your candidate. Because the thing is, if they put a sign up, they're going to vote for your candidate. And a lot of their neighbors are going to vote for your candidate. So you want to ask at every single door. Now, obviously, if they say they're definitely not going to vote for your candidate, then don't don't bother them any further because that's pointless. But but if they're not sure, ask them if you could put a sign up. And and you'd be surprised. A lot of them were like, yeah, that's fine. You can put a sign up because they don't see it as being harmful. They may not be sure yet who they're voting for, but but once they put that sign out, they're voting for you. It's a it's done. <laughs> All right, branding, super important. And this is something we found out on the campaign um, is your branding can actually win you, win you votes. You know, it's, it's funny because these low information voters, a lot of the time they don't, they don't really educate themselves on what the candidate's all about. It's more about like, what does the candidate look like? What is the candidate's name? Do they resonate with that? Do they see the signs and it looks like a cool sign? I'll tell you, one door that I knocked on um, when I was campaigning or when I was canvassing for Kalish was somebody who had no idea what she stood for, but they had seen her signs and wanted one. Um, like they, when I came and they saw my shirt and they knew where I was coming from and they came running outside and asked me, can I have a sign? And then, then we started talking about Kalish. And she, had, you know, this person had no idea who Kalish was. She just liked the sign. So <laughs> you're going to want to have somebody who's can put together these really nice looking signs for you. Um, yeah, I was going to say, you know, that a lot of people will be like, oh, well, I kind of know Photoshop. I've got a buddy who, who kind of does throw some things together. Don't do it. Like, get somebody who really understands graphic design, spend the money, maybe a couple hundred dollars, or maybe there's somebody who, who is a good buddy of yours who also does graphic design. Um, but, but get a quality logo going on with it and then stick with that, that logo, stick with those fonts, with your literature, stick with those colors. Uh, there can be some variations of those colors, but like you, you've got to stick with your branding. Um, you know, brand confusion is really a, a big thing with like small businesses. It can be the same thing with a with a campaign too. But when we're going off name recognition, especially like I've got a weird name, and there's also this joke about you know, do any uh, do libertarians ever run somebody with a with a normal name? Because <laughs> you see a lot of unusual <laughs> names among us, but. You know, especially for somebody like me, where I've got an unusual name, I, that brand recognition helps with the uh, help stick with people. Um, but again, you, know, you go with somebody who knows what they're doing uh, and and get a good logo going. Yeah, and make sure you have a sign that stands out. You don't want your signs to blend in. That was one of the things. Like I noticed every single neighborhood we went into, and this was very discouraging. Every single neighborhood we went into had. Um, Kalisha's 21 year old opponent signs out in them. And I noticed them everywhere. But then when I talked to other people, they talked about Kalisha's signs. And I was like, yeah, but, um, but this guy has his signs out too. And they were like, I haven't seen any of his signs. 
So if your signs blend in, if they just look like a standard political sign, nobody's going to notice them. So you got to right. really have something that's unique and different. Yeah, uh, the red, white, and blue is definitely played out, uh, especially when you're talking about a presidential year, when, you know, like when I ran to, but a lot of people stick with the red, white, and blue. I had people here do, and, they, and yes, they won their elections, but they were just so upset that I wasn't going to go with the something that was red, white blue that kind of thing and uh and you know and we're going with a back black background too like that was just unheard of but we wanted something different and again yeah my, my opponent's sign was red white and blue and people just weren't seeing it it blends in with everybody else's sign so don't yeah. be afraid to step outside the norm yeah we were the only ones seeing it which i hated seeing it <laughs> <laughs> i had to but talk we them down a few times you get really discouraged and i just say remember we just got to stay in our own lane and again it's like who's the boss kind of thing and it, yeah. it, it's definitely a partnership he would keep me on track i would keep him on track too it's really easy to di get discouraged start worrying about what the other plant uh what the other person is doing the other opponents are doing but you just you stay in your lane you focus on the win and just keep moving forward <laughs> yep absolutely um earn media strategy so one of the things we did is we actually had a uh we had a press um press secretary for the campaign um, and this was really helpful in getting us some earned media. You know, we were able to do get interviews on radio, um, and that was really beneficial. We continued to have Kalish write some of those columns for the newspaper. We kind of had her be the only one doing some of those columns towards the end of the campaign, so that they saw her name over and over again in those in those uh, columns. Um, one of the things we planned on doing was like coffee meetings that didn't work out because of COVID but that's certainly something that would be helpful. Um, public appearances, again, we didn't get to do a lot of those. We did a couple, but overall, we weren't able to do a lot of those because of COVID. Um, but the print media and radio interviews can be very helpful. And it's, so it's, it's helpful to have somebody who can make those connections for you, like having a press secretary um, to get those interviews. Um, let's see. The organization, so your campaign team is going to be multifaceted. This is what we had on Kalisha's campaign. We had the campaign manager, um, campaign treasurer, of course, is very important. We had a field director, which basically the field director um, kind of directs where the candidate goes and that kind of thing, and also kind of takes takes the uh, lead in a lot of the door-to-door the -door campaigning and the messaging. Um, Canvassing director was somebody who would direct the canvassing. So all the volunteers, um, she would set the schedule for those. Um, phone banking director would set the schedule for the phone banking people, kind of take charge of that. Um, so we had a Spanish outreach lead so that anytime we knew somebody was Spanish speaking or if we came across somebody who was Spanish speaking, we'd have her follow up with them or do the initial contact. Um, and that's very important if you have a, an area, if you live in an area with a lot of Spanish speakers, um, it's very important to have somebody who can speak that language or it may be another language, depending on where you live, maybe Vietnamese or Chinese or whatever. Um, it's important to have somebody on your campaign who can kind of take that, take that spot, take that role. Um, press secretary, again, I think is very important. Um, so if you can get one, then great. Um, development director, those are the people who help you make those contacts and get the big money because um, they're the ones who should be reaching out to the the big donors um, and making those appointments for the candidate to meet with them and ask for big dollars. Um, let's see, graphic designer, should say designer, not designed, but graphic designer. Again, we talked about that with the branding. Um, somebody who does manages the IT and the website, um, that kind of thing is important. And it's important because um, especially with your local campaigns, a lot of people don't take the time to develop a website. Um, so I think it's really important for for our campaigns to have a website that you can look at. So if you're somebody who uh, may be a low information voter, they don't know a lot of the, about their local politics, but maybe they're somebody who does the research and like when they're filling out their ballots, they look like look up the names of the candidates. If you're the only candidate with a website, you're the only one who they're gonna 
know anything about, so they're likely going to vote for you. Um, let's see. Um, vendors, you're going to need to find vendors for all these things. So direct mail. Who's who's going to print and mail out um, your your mailers? Um, your print shop. Who's like we got print shirts printed. We got um, signs printed. These kinds of things. You're going to need to find out who's going to do that and what the cost is going to be. What kind of services are you going to use for phone banking and robocalls? Um, these are things you have to figure out what the cost is going to end up being. Um, campaign management software. So we were really beneficial um, at, that we were able to use um, for campaign management software. We were able to use um, eCanvasser, which was provided to us by the national party. Um, you know. That's something that you should look into. One person makes a $35 donation to the national party, and then the national party will provide a campaign with this software. And it was really helpful. It was an app that was available on your phone. So as you were going knock door knocking um, doors, can doing the door-to-door -door canvassing, you were able to look at a map. You can fill in the information as you're going so that you know which doors you've hit, what the response was at those doors. Um, you can start adding up the the win, the people who say they're gonna vote for you. So you can put that on your win number um, or as on your metric moving towards your win number. Um, so it was really useful software. If you're not gonna use, or if you canvassers not available, or if you aren't gonna use that, then it's still important to have some kind of software. Don't do this old style paper campaigning. It's not useful. Um, voter data, you can get the voter data from the registrar of voters in your area, or you can get it, sometimes you can get it and get more data from other, um, other sites, like L2 is an excellent source for voter data. Um, you might have to pay a bit for it. Now, fortunately you can, you know, at least in California, you can work out um, arrangements with the state party um but voter data getting more than what the registrar of voters has can be very helpful um so i definitely um suggest looking into getting that information from a company like l2 um timeline is very important we talked about that earlier just developing that timeline sorry i'm kind of rushing through because i want to make sure that we have time for questions um let's see so developing a timeline is really important, knowing when, th when things need to be done. And that's everything from your filings to when you're gonna develop your mailers, um, when you're gonna send your mailers out, all that stuff. Please yeah, and Kara, Kara made a good point of that too, of working your way backwards. You find out what your date is for the election date and then start working your way back from there. And I think that was really, that was really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's also important to have a shared calendar so everybody knows what everybody's doing at any given time. Like, so that, you know, so, cause the candidate's gonna be pulled from a lot of different sides. Um, so maybe the field director wants the candidate to do something, or maybe the uh, development director wants the candidate to meet with the donor. They need to know what the cal that candidate's schedule is. <clears throat> so it's really important to have like a shared calendar using something like Google provides some services um, through G Suite that can be helpful with that. Um, and then another thing that's really important, something that we learned in this campaign is to make a splash if you can. We found that we had some extra bucks um, as we were going forward. We were planning, we, one thing we were planning on doing to kind of make a splash that's kind of unique and different and pretty much anybody can do is a car con convoy with a bunch of cars lined up of your volunteers, supporters going out pretty close to election day. Um, and, you know, with signs and honking horns and, you know, having, yeah, a PA system. So, so people can hear you talking about the candidate as you're driving through. We drove through every single neighborhood in the district. Um, but on top of that, that, that's actually a pretty cheap thing to do. Um, so almost any campaign can do the, the car convoy and that's a good way to make a splash. But on top of that, we had a few extra bucks hang, hanging around that we hadn't spent. So we decided to have an aerial banner, 
Um, so we had an airplane fly overhead with uh, Kalish for Hanford City Council or something like that. I forget exactly what it said. Yeah, Morrow, Morrow, Morrow City Council, yeah, is something. Yeah. And so we had an actual aerial banner come over and nobody had seen that in Hanford ever. And so it was really, <laughs> it really made a splash. Um, it was, it was pretty exciting. And we got, we got a lot of, you know, attention from the Libertarian Party nationally when we did that too. Um, it's pretty and, cool. and one thing, to, yeah, that, that was definitely uh, noteworthy. Uh, but then there's other things too, just, you know, look at different ways that you can, you can be different from other campaigns that they see. I think because of COVID, we had to really get creative with, with this stuff. And if you're not necessarily a creative person, try to get somebody on your team that is creative, that can kind of think outside the box and those things. I, I feel very gifted and lucky that, that I, tend to think that way so you know um meet and greets like we said weren't really a thing you know coffee grabbing coffee with people uh but instead of doing that we were doing park cleanups and in one area particularly when we're talking about outreach to uh some of these areas with lower voter turnout uh they're they're ones that are more uh economically depressed uh there was a park right there which we're you know now that i'm on council we're going to start addressing but it's been underserved uh, there's a bunch of apartment complexes over there. It's the only green space that they really have. You, they, they don't have patios and those kinds of things, you know, a small patio. Anyway, I made a point of doing a park clean up there and I went around, just did a quick little postcard printout, went around, hit all those doors. It was super quick. Maybe talked to a couple people who were outside and just said we were doing a park cleanup. And then after the park cleanup, we're doing a barbecue right there in the park. And granted, there wasn't a lot of turnout for the help with that, but just the fact that we were doing something in their neighborhood really made an impression on them. And that was very lasting for a lot of people too. And that went a long way, but we, you know, we, we did get a few people that, that popped their heads out and came over and said, well, nobody's ever paid attention to this. So, uh, but definitely, you know, just going to looking outside the box. Yeah. Meet and greets weren't a practical thing, but we can do park cleanups and everybody gets a space out, maybe talk a little bit after that, but, uh, again, looking at thinking outside the box. I'm a very, very big advocate for that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the park cleanup's a great idea for probably almost any local campaign, probably better than your coffee meetings with candidates. Yeah. I mean, I mean, do both. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I mean, because I think the park cleanups are a great way to show that you care. And it's also a great way to show the voluntary, the volunteerism in the libertarian party and in our in our platform and our message um, to say hey look we're going to do this voluntarily no government needed to come out and do this cleanup um so yeah so i think it's a great thing that we did and i recommend all camp campaigns do it um so we were i was going to talk about the different types of leadership so Basically, strategic leadership is kind of out on the at the outset, kind of coming up with a strategy, coming up with your attack plan. This is how we're going to win this war, um, and so that's really falls in the the realm of the campaign manager. The logistical details that's like spending money, making sure that you know you have enough volunteers, you have the signs you need, you have the mailers ready. All of those are logistical details. Um, and those again, those fall on the campaign manager. Um, so what what is the candidate responsible for? And also kind of the field director in a lot of ways and the development director um, would be like more the tactical things. The tactical things are like what you're doing on the spot. So as a can as a candidate, when you're approaching a door and somebody asks you some question that you weren't ready to answer, how are you gonna answer that question? You gotta be able to think on your feet. Um, you got to be ready for that kind of stuff. There are some things you can do to prepare for that, like uh, Toastmasters is one example. You know, they really help you with public speaking and being able to to represent yourself well. Um, then the diplomatic side is, so diplomatic intelligence is being able to communicate effectively and make agreements and, and arrangements with others. So this is really important with getting those big donors, those, those big bucks. Um, yeah, we didn't promise anything to anybody when we were asking for these donations. What we did is we went in with our plan, 
what we wanted to do, you know, whether it be reducing regulations, cutting some of the red tape, um, changing, freeing up some of the zoning restrictions, that kind of stuff. So we'd, we'd go in with this, with our information about the candidates plan and um, ask for, for the money from people who we thought might benefit from some of those things, but we didn't promise anything. It, it, it takes that diplomatic approach, just being able to communicate effectively. Um, anything to add on that, Kalish? Um, not really. I think you, yeah, you covered that. Uh, and again, we, you know, for an example, there is a develop here, developer here, and I had been kind of outspoken with his, about his development earlier on. But it was more, the issue would happen to be more with the sweetheart deals that the city makes. And uh, it left me with some sour grapes and I'd heard some, you know, bad reputation about this developer too. And we were, I was worried that I was going to get those, those asks. And I, I, you know, I'm not in it for special interests or anything like that, but I got talked into going and speaking with him anyway. And we, we discussed it ahead of time. If he were to ask us anything um, that was, you know, again, special interest, we walk away. You'd be pre prepared to walk away. And what we found, at least in this instance, was he just wanted free market solutions and he was willing to support me because free market solutions. And, you know, now I'm happy to say, too, I was able to send him a text message or call him the other day, actually, and, and say, hey, guess what? We're moving forward on something. I was able to present it to council and it's going to come back for a study session, yada, yada, yada. We might be able to get these things done in, a, in record time, you know, less than a month. Um, but again, without without doing any kind of special interest, so. Yeah, and you're welcome, Kalish, for making you go and meet with him even though <laughs> at the time you didn't want to. Who's <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> so, the boss, right? <laughs> exactly, who's the boss? This was one of those areas where Kalish was just like, nope, I'm not gonna do it. And I'm like, <laughs> yes, yes, you are. <laughs> and that, that worked out great. So that's yeah. when it just comes down to trust. Um, so that now after the campaign's over, you've done all this work, you win or lose, what do you do next? You do a campaign postmortem. So what you're going to do, you're going to, first, you're going to look at all the facts. How much money did you spend? How much did money did you spend on what? Um, how many doors did you knock successfully? How many homes were you to, able to reach by phone banking? You know, all of this stuff, you're going to want to figure out like just the facts, get the facts listed in in the campaign postmortem and then what do you do with those facts you analyze it what worked what didn't work what what was basically neutral what came out in the wash that you know what were the lessons learned what what would you do for future campaigns um what do you think you'd just skip out on because why spend money on things that weren't beneficial or you didn't feel were beneficial to your campaign um so this is really important to do after you're done with your campaign to do a postmortem so that you can learn from your your uh, successes, your failures, and you know hopefully that you, you can use that for future campaigns. Um, and so uh, let's see, I think that's it. So if you wanna reach out to either Kalish or I, I've got our emails on here. Um, so you can contact me by emailing me at kolson at lpcaucus.org or Kalish, you can reach her at kalishdrake at gmail.com. Um, and that is it. So I'm gonna stop sharing and then we'll look and see if we've got any questions. Let's see. All right, let's see. Social media director, somebody asked about what's, what about social media director? And I think that can be really important. Um, I do think that social media is very important. We used it a lot in our campaign. Fortunately, in this situation, Kalish and I were very knowledgeable about social media, how to use it as a platform, especially Kalish, um, kind of doing more of the design aspects um, of the social media. Um, but we both used it very effectively. So it's important whether you need a social media director or somebody else just kind of managing that, maybe your IT or website person, um, kind of up to you, um, but, but it certainly can be important, but don't rely only on social media. 
that is a huge mistake that I see a lot of candidates make. Right. It, Not it's everybody's going to see it. Right. It, it's a it's a tool. And one of the things, too, I've learned early on, I think a lot of us know, uh, go lives are really important. But I, I wanted to try to do something on a regular basis. And I wasn't able to do that um, just because the schedule would get really crazy. So I found a program and I used two different programs. One, it was like an editing software. So I was able to prepare my notes on issues that were going on with Hanford or, or things I was involved with. I would do what I called coffee and a candidate. I would discuss some different things or even be on site for things get the recordings done and when I had it had the time I would cut and edit it again this is something you can outsource to somebody else I just happened to, that's in my wheelhouse so I, I took care of it myself I did the cut and editing and then I had a second software um, and I'm trying to remember what it was right now there's a bunch of, uh, of them out there but I uploaded it to a different site and then it did the go live for me just like you would a normal go live, except I didn't have to be physically present for it. It scheduled it, it went live, um, and it still hit the algorithms that you need to hit with the uh, with Facebook. And it it it's far more effective than just uploading a video uh, when you do the go live. So anyway, just a just kind of like a side note right there of a tactic that I use, and I think it was really really effective. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see another, not necessarily a question, but it, but. A uh, very useful comment. Um, somebody says, "I ran two times and failed in another, another city before I won my third race. My last loss was 19 votes." Yeah, just because you run and and don't win doesn't mean you're not going to win. Don't give up. It sucks to lose. It it really does suck to lose. I I saw last year some other people who I was consulting with their campaigns that loss, one person came really close. And I think if they had a campaign manager, which they didn't, they would have won, hands down. Um, somebody else that, that I saw, they had a campaign manager, but they weren't really ready. And some of their messaging was targeting more conservative voters and they lived in a very blue area. So that's kind of like, you gotta look at who your voters are. Um, you're gonna lose if you're targeting red in a heavily blue area. I'm sorry, I know that you think you can pull off those Republican voters and that might make a difference, but if you're in a heavily Democratic area, it's not gonna make a difference. You're just gonna lose. Um, so you gotta figure out how you can reach out to the whoever your voter base is in your area. Um, and so, but it sucks to lose, but you, if you do that campaign post-mortem, you can learn a lot from that. So please don't give up, you know, Run again. If you feel like you did a good job as a candidate, please run again and get a campaign manager to help you. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Let's see, somebody saying uh, for campaign assets, go to ignitefoundationllc.com. Somebody, I don't, I didn't use that, so I don't know anything about it, but I'll just throw it out there so people can check it out. Um, let's see. See a lot of positive comments. Um, let's see. Seeing if okay. So yeah, another person said that they uh, their third time they they won. So again, don't give up. Um, I don't see any other questions. If anybody has a question, please go ahead and put it up. Um, and again, if uh, anybody wants to reach out to me and let me know of future things, future things that you want to know more about, anything from this training that you need more information on, please hit me up. I'm, I'm as the campaign director for the Libertarian Pragmatist Caucus, I'm going to be doing these kinds of trainings. Um, the plan is monthly. That That's the ideal. Um, so as long as we've got people to do the trainings and we've got um, information that people want to be trained on, you know, we'll be doing these monthly. And so we'll go into more de depth with a lot of these trainings moving forward. Um, let's see. Somebody says, thank you for doing this. Do you have any additional advice you would share about turning an announcement or timing an announcement for, for intention to run? So, you know, it's funny because with Kalisha's campaign, we actually didn't do any like super 
big announcement. Like we didn't do anything with the press. We didn't do a press release or anything. We just kind of announced it on so social media. But that was because we announced like super early that she was running. Um, and we didn't want to give a big heads up to her opponents that we were starting that early. So we kind of wanted to keep it quiet. It was kind of, it was kind of a strategic thing that we were doing because um, we wanted to start raising the funds, but not really, you know, get the word out to our opponents that we were going that hard. Um, now, as far as doing an announcement, I think that it would be a good idea to do some kind of an event um, and send out a press release um, for the event or some kind of an announcement about the event that you're going to be having. Um, probably for some of these local races, you don't want to, you don't expect a huge turnout at these events. Cause let's face it. A lot of people in the cities just don't really pay attention or care. So probably something more to just your, the press and, you know, just to get the word out, maybe do a small meeting in a coffee shop or something. I wouldn't recommend like this big, like expecting a huge turnout and doing it like on the steps of the city building or something. You know, because then you're going to have like five people show up and it's going to be kind of embarrassing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't reflect on your campaign. It's just a lot of people are apathetic to the local politics. Um, let's see. If you have to pick and choose campaign positions, what do you all think are key? Some races may not require that much um, diving up. And sometimes you can't get enough qualified volunteers. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, absolutely essential are candidate and campaign manager. Um, and what, this is actually one of the things that I meant to get into is how to figure out like what number of volunteers you need for your campaign. So I would say that, you know, just to figure out how many volunteers you need total, look at the number of voters you have. I would say for every thousand voters that you have in your district, you want between five and 10 volunteers. Um, so that can be, end up being a lot of volunteers. Um, for Kalisha's campaign, we had about 40. Um, but when we look at like what you're going to have, if, if, if you've only got two people that, you know, that you can trust in uh, doing like the campaign management side of the house, then I would say probably the most important would be the campaign manager who would just kind of do everything else. And then the campaign treasurer because campaign treasurer work is a lot of work, so you want to have somebody dedicated for that. Um, if you can separate it out and have more people, you're definitely going to want to have like IT website design um, in there. Um, let's see. I mean, a lot of the stuff, if it's a smaller campaign, the campaign manager can do, because as campaign manager, you can do the development director work. You know, I, I reached out to a lot of the, the big donors and set those meetings up for Kalish, um, you can, you can do like the field director work. Um, that, that was something that I did a lot of while I was doing the campaign is a lot of the field director stuff. Um, I think when you have a lot of volunteers doing door to door, I think it is important to have a canvassing director. Um, so that's one of the more important jobs, more important roles. Um, I would say, um, I don't know, Kalish, what, what do you think? looking at it yeah i think you know obviously having your campaign manager is the utmost importance and then um if you're trying to keep it very small or you know you you've got a very small district uh and maybe not the, the competition isn't very steep in your race too yeah you can outsource again like you don't necessarily have to have a graphic designer as part of your your group but reach out to a graphic designer and just outsource to somebody uh, yeah. Just hire somebody, take care of some things, and they don't have to be a part of your team. But Yeah, and actually this comes important. to one of our other questions. What about hiring it at, hiring it out? Um, I mean, sometimes you just need to hire stuff out or out stuff. Yeah, uh, absolutely. That's something that is true. Sometimes it's helpful to just hire somebody. We hired – our web designer was hired. We paid our, our web designer. Um, our IT person was actually separate and um, – we did not pay them. They were voluntary. Um, and fortunately our branding was done for, by somebody for free. Um, so we didn't have to pay for that. 
But, you know, if you've got the money in your campaign and you have, especially if you've got a lot of doors to hit, you may have to pay for, for door knockers. You may have to have more than just volunteers because if you have a lot of doors to hit every day, you got to ha have people you can count on. And volunteers, we were very fortunate that we had very dedicated volunteers, but you may have to have hire people to go out and canvas for you. Um, so certainly you're going to spend money in this campaign, whatever the campaign is. Um, but, you know, as much as possible, be realistic about to try to spend the money on the campaign itself, not on staff and, and people. Um, but, but sometimes you do have to spend some money on, on that. Um, let's see. Of course you have to trust the person or company. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's important. We used for our, um, a lot of their vendors, we use local that turns out to be more expensive, but we knew we could trust these, the local vendors. Um, Oh, and with that, that yeah. information sometimes. We, yeah. yeah the, lo the other candidates would be using similar peoples. And I mean, I guess likewise, too, they can let other people know what we're doing as well. But um, but it kind of gave us a heads up in certain instances. Yeah, absolutely. We knew when our opponents were going to be out canvassing. Um, one of our, our younger 21-year-old opponents started canvassing really late in the game. Um, cause we got Intel that he, his, uh, door hanger was just being printed up towards the end of the campaign. And so we were like, wow, he's getting out late. And we kind of mm -hmm. laughed, laughed it off. Um, we, you rookie. <laughs> yeah. Um, you was me and, four years ago. <laughs> yeah. And then as far as the, uh, um, the other opponent, we got Intel that they were going to be sending out a mailer. And so that was something that we, we were kind of looking out for and had some people in the district that we knew kind of paying attention to. Um, burnout. Yeah, burnout could be a problem. One of the things that we faced in this campaign is we were running this campaign during the wildfires here, here in California, and we had some fires that were pretty close to us. And so you didn't just have burnout in the number of hours that we were putting in, but we had people um, just getting burned out in sense of they Same. were getting sick from all the smoke they were breathing. And so we'd just tell them, hey, take some time off. Um, mm -hmm. But fortunately, because we had this planned out in advance, we could lose some of those days. So so give give your volunteers breaks. Um, if you can't afford to give people breaks, then but you do have some money, pay people to do the job. But yeah, and I think that there's, you know, I might get crucified by some people about this, but... It, I know at least for myself and, uh, you know, and then like Brent too, like when you we're, we're the type that will just go, 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 go until we're, we're done. I think um, planning it out, especially, you know, this was a marathon for us. We started really early on. We, we knew like this final month or whatever, that was going to be where we hit the hardest and we just, you know, went balls to the wall. But leading up to that, we would kind of plan some, a couple days where it was just to ourselves, to our family, those things. And like that, that kind of helped, you know, at least for me, I think for Brent to like keep us going and be like, okay, just a few more days. And then I get, I'm completely off the grid yep. for a day or so hang out with my family. I don't have that guilt. Uh, you know, that, that's still, I'm a big proponent okay. for, for self-care. And when you're, th th this is a stressful situation. And if you're burning out and you just want to go and bury your head in the sand, it doesn't do anybody any good. Yeah. Yeah. So give your volunteers some time off. If, if there's something going on and you just need a day off or something, which happens sometimes, take it. Just you, it's something that you really need to communicate with with your team about. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, we all took time off on occasion. I know I did a couple of times when I planned on going out and doing stuff. I know Kalish did, and I know some of our volunteers did as well. Especially at the time when we had the wire, wildfires, because um, there's so much smoke in the air. Um, mm -hmm. So um, let's see. No other questions it looks like, but what I do, I do want to remind people that anything you want more in-depth information on, please send me an email. That's kolson at lpcaucus.org. Um, and we'll try to set up future trainings to address some of those things. Um, 
probably next month we'll have a training on kind of how to build your resume as a future candidate. Um, something that if you're running next year, you got to really get on the ball and get ready for that. Um, right now. <laughs> yeah, because it, cause it's something that can take a few years. You don't want to you don't want to get ahead of yourself. I mean, running a campaign and losing is not the end of the world. So you, I'm not saying don't run your campaign if you haven't built the resume, but start building that resume. Yes, Kay Olson at lpcaucus.org. Somebody just asked if that was correct. That is right. Um, so let's see if I can. I'm going to put that up there. Facebook user, just so everybody could see. Um, yeah, so that's probably going to be one of the next trainings. Also, I want to have Kalish come back and talk about um, what it's like when you are elected, because that's something you have to prepare for as well. Because we, you know, we don't, most of us don't go into this knowing exactly what the job actually is going to be like. So, um, all right, and somebody wants to share the slides. Um, send me an email, and I'll send you. I'll send you the slides. Um, and it looks like we are out of time. So thank you, everybody. Look forward to talking to you all next month, and look, looking forward to providing everybody future trainings. And thank you so much for Kalish. I'll see you in about an hour. Yeah. Thank you, Brent. We'll see you soon. And thank you everybody for joining us. And again, feel free to reach out. Yes. Thanks. Take care. Right, bye.